Today at the National Press Club, the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. The government secured parliamentary support for its carbon pricing plan. Now the Prime Minister is trying to win public support. She's fighting for the reform and the future of her government. The Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, gives today's address to the National Press Club. Welcome to the National Press Club for today's special National Australia Bank address by the Prime Minister. I'm not sure if Bastille Day has uh, any particular significance, but I would note that tomorrow is actually the anniversary of the first occasion on which the Prime Minister appeared here as Prime Minister in that role. Of course, the, the last 12 months have had their challenges for the government, as we all know, and uh, there's no question that the past week, uh, in the past week, they've embraced one of the, um, taken on one of the more important and difficult challenges uh, that they will face, convincing a sceptical public of the need to impose a tax on carbon as part of a long-term strategy to reduce carbon emissions. Please welcome the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. The issues that have brought me here to the Press Club have always been the big issues as Prime Minister, laying out my vision for Australia in a national election campaign and making my case in the leaders' debate, reflecting on the formation of the government and announcing our plan to rebuild Queensland. I come here today because pricing carbon is surely as important as any of these. As Joe Biden no doubt wishes he'd said, this is a big deal. In my own service in government, I stand on my record as a reformer, a new workplace relations system which locked in modern labour values, fairness at work and flexible enterprise bargaining, education reforms which gave parents information and offered them choices they'd never had before, difficult reforms which I knew were in the long-term national interest. And under our Fair Work Act, employment is growing. Under our school reforms, school performance is improving. Time has vindicated the reform case. It always does. Now, pricing carbon is the government's biggest reform yet. When I look at this decision in the context of Australia's post-1983 reform project, it does take on interesting dimensions. Compared with a change like the GST, it's smaller in the short term and more important in the long term. Vastly less complex, applying to hundreds of businesses, not millions. Modest in its impact on household budgets, estimated to add 0.7 per cent to CPI, not 2.5 per cent, as did the GST. But for the long term, it achieves a change of far greater structural significance, decoupling the growth of carbon pollution from the growth of our economy. Amara's law is the idea that when we think about a new technology, we tend to overestimate its effect in the short run and underestimate its effect in the long run. Real structural reform is often like that. The dollar float is the paradigm example the big enabling decision, the big change, which sets the ball rolling for all the others, the big call for the future, which demands the courage at the time, and which, when we look back, no one, no one would seek to undo. The carbon price is our dollar float, a vital economic reform which will build our clean energy future. So I want every Australian to know why I'm pursuing this. Yes, climate cha change is a threat to our environment. Yes, being left behind the world is a threat to our economy. But I'm not just doing this to protect Australia against threats. I'm doing it because I see a great opportunity we can seize. I see a great clean energy future for our great country. Within a few years, we'll see big changes on the energy supply side, big changes in industrial production, changes amongst consumers and households as well. Energy producers investing more and more in gas and renewables, manufacturers and commercial buildings and hospitals converting boilers from coal-fired to gas, 
tenants chasing space in energy efficient buildings and chemical plants installing scrubbers to reduce nitrous oxide emissions, the capture and use or flaring of emissions from mining and gas extraction, industry installing more efficient motors. And yes, we'll see smart light bulbs in every home and we'll probably live to see five star beer fridges. These are the changes we can already predict. I know these changes are upon us because I've seen them beginning already. This week, I saw geothermal power in Brunswick, in Melbourne, in July, not a time we associate with a great deal of heat, a source of energy which we would usually associate in our minds with hot rocks in the central desert. And there it is in suburban Melbourne heating a building. This week, I've seen energy produced from landfill in suburban Brisbane, where rubbish from households and businesses generates methane gas, which is then captured and used. In the past, that carbon pollution would simply have gone into our atmosphere. These gases are now being captured and powering homes in Brisbane through the electricity grid. These are the changes we can already see, and there are changes coming we can hardly imagine. In our lifetimes, think of how information technology has transformed itself and transformed our lives. I wrote my first university essays on a manual typewriter. I remember the first mobile phone I ever saw. It was as big as a brick. And I remember thinking to myself, why would anyone want a thing like that? Now, when I visit classrooms, there are children there using a phone to take a photo of me, sharing it with the world via the internet before I've even walked back to my car to get back to the office. We walk around now with more computing power in our purses and wallets than NASA used for the moon landings. And we apply that technology to new purposes, which we never thought of until the power to do them existed. Information technology has given us the productivity and prosperity, which means our children can afford to travel before they've even really started a career. It gives us the social networks, which let us look at the photos they've taken of themselves in Thailand just an hour ago, and then we can instantly send them a message by text. Is that another tattoo? And yes, it's created whole new occupations and industries for them to work in for when they come home and settle down for that career in life. Clean energy is sure to transform itself and transform our lives in just as many extraordinary ways. We talk about baseload power today, but smart grids and distributed energy production may fundamentally reshape the way we move energy from the production point to the power point. In less time than we know, millions of homes may be powered by renewable energy, tidal in WA, solar in our sunny Queensland, wind in New South Wales, geothermal in my home state of South Australia, clean coal in Victoria, cogeneration in Tasmania. But behind all these changes, behind what we do see, will be the big reform, the price on carbon pollution. Revenue from carbon pollution will be funding new investments in clean technology. The economic incentive in the price will drive that private investment. It creates the incentive for change. We can already forecast $100 billion going into renewables by 2050. The power of a market mechanism driving investment in the power of the earth, wind, water and sun. We've heard a bit of talk about how carbon permits are an invisible product. They're not an invisible product, they're an invisible hand. The decision to put a price on carbon is a major reform to build a clean energy future. And because I lead a Labor government, it's a reform done fairly. Economic and environmental reform with help for those who need it the most. Because that is how Labor does reform. That is how Australia does reform. And that is the way 
that reform works best. As we did with currency and trade liberalisation, as we did with indirect taxation, we've had a long debate about the clean energy future for our nation. Barry Jones and Bob Carr, overseas, even, even Margaret Thatcher, spoke about this in the 1980s. We debated Rio and then Kyoto in the 1990s. And through the 2000s, there was growing public support for action on climate change, public support which did ultimately lead to bipartisan support for pricing carbon pollution. To the then coalition government and the then Labor opposition, both taking carbon pricing plans to an election. To 2007, when Joe How John Howard decided to price carbon, supported by Tony Abbott and Julie Bishop and Joe Hockey and Greg Hunt. To 2008 and 2009, when Kevin Rudd tried to negotiate with Malcolm Turnbull in good faith to get a bipartisan reform. Now, in the final weeks of 2009, we know the last parliament, in the immortal words of Maxwell Smart, missed it by that much, by that much. And what followed was the 2010 campaign, as difficult and as divisive as any we've ever known. It's been a long debate. And as I said on Sunday, no government, no political party or leader can claim to have got everything right during this time. But the parliament the people elected in 2010 has found the path to the clean energy future our country so badly needs. Some were sceptical, but from the day I formed government, I had no doubt the parliament would prove capable of the task. I know that for the aficionados, and there are many in this room, the mechanics of how we got here are fascinating. The cross-party nature of this process is unusual, and the makeup of the House of Representatives in particular is novel. I accept that's interesting to the commentators. But for me, this is reform. And in reform, what matters is having the right vision for the country's future, making the big decisions which get us there, bringing people together to get it done. So we've had the debate. Now we move from words to deeds. We're going to get this done. This will be the package that comes to the parliament, and this will be the package that goes through the parliament. There will be a price on carbon from the 1st of July 2012, and hear how it's, how it's going to work. I wanted a modern policy approach with efficient allocation and incentive to innovate. So the price on carbon operates as a market mechanism, creating the incentives we need. For the first three years, the price for each tonne of pollution will be fixed, starting at $23 per tonne, then rising by 2.5 per cent in real terms. This is effectively a carbon tax. I wanted the end point to be a flexibly priced emissions trading scheme. So from 1 July 2015, there will be a cap and trade market, creating the incentive to cut pollution at the lowest cost. I knew there was no environmental benefit in emissions-intensive, trade-exposed production simply moving offshore. So we will allocate some permits to some businesses without charge, supporting jobs and competitiveness, and helping strongly affected industries make the transition to a clean energy future. I also wanted to link our carbon price to the emerging international market keeping Australian industry competitive. So Australian businesses will be able to buy permits which represent credible additional offshore pollution reductions. I wanted our emissions reduction targets to be based on the best expert advice. So the Independent Climate Change Authority, headed by Bernie Fraser, a great servant of the Australian public, will recommend on the year-by-year -year steps as well as the longer-term path that Australia should take towards its 2050 target. This is how carbon pricing will work. A price for the first years, a fix for the first years, a well-designed market from 2015, assistance for emissions-intensive trade-exposed industries, 
evidence-based emissions targets, abatement at the lowest economic cost, a new bottom line where polluters pay. Our plan makes polluters pay, because we know some of, but because we know some of the costs will be passed through, and while the price <coughs> impact will be modest, we also know family bud budgets are tight. So, as I've talked to people in the last few days, I've been keen to explain to them how they will be assisted. And many have asked me, how will my family fare? What benefits will my family get? I've said to them that people who need help will get the help they need. That's why nine in 10 households will get a combination of tax cuts and payment increases. For almost six million households, this will fully meet the average extra costs. And of these, more than four million Australian households, including every older Australian who relies solely on the pension, will get a buffer for their budget, with the extra payments being 20 per cent higher than their average extra costs. Because delivering this help to households meant cutting tax and lifting payments, I decided at the very outset we would take the opportunity for tax reform as well. I saw the opportunity to use a new tax on pollution to cut an old tax on work. Just as I did in the budget, so in this household assistance package, I wanted to reward work. So we've more than tripled the tax-free threshold, lifting it from $6,000 per year to $18,200 per year. And combined with other changes, this means that 450,000 people, 450,000, who earn between $18,000 and $20,500 per year will have all their tax cut. They will now pay no tax. This doesn't just help people moving from welfare to work, though it does help them. It also helps women who work part-time as well. Let's take an example. Let's look at a family where the kids are at primary school and mum is working part-time. Say she's earning $16,000 a year. Currently, she has no net tax liability. But she does have some tax withheld from her take-home pay and she can't claim it back until the end of the financial year. What's more, if she decides to take an extra shift or take on some extra regular hours of work, say an extra $4,000 per year, that'll lift her over the tax-free threshold and cost her $600 a year in tax. Now, because of our tax cuts, she'll pay no tax at all on that extra income and have very little tax withheld as well. She's among half a million people who will go from having to pay tax to paying no tax. And of those, 300,000 are women. And while 44% of taxpayers are women, 60% of the people who will get this tax cut are women. This is a tax cut for working women, a tax reform which rewards work. And it builds on our budget reforms to lift workforce participation and build the capacity of our economy to grow faster over time. And because we want to reward work, we've also made special provision for self-funded retirees. I think by now many people will know our plan will help pensioners, and you'd expect that. But our plan also ensures that many self-funded retirees all those who have a Commonwealth health care card receive a payment equivalent to the pension increase. And some others will benefit from our tax cuts and our payment increases as well. Australians understand the importance of cutting carbon and understand that their own household budget works and how it works and they want to know what pricing carbon is going to mean for them. So I often get asked questions about this. And I also get asked, as Australians have come to understand the facts, if so many households are compensated, how does the price signal work? They're effectively asking me, isn't the shoe meant to pinch? Well, there are two key points here. First, the price signal operates on polluters. They compete against each other, and if they pollute less, they'll pay less tax 
compared to other polluters. And they compete against producers who don't pay the tax, so if they produce less, their disadvantage will be less. This means that there is a very significant incentive on the supply side to reduce carbon emissions. This will work on our big polluting companies. Second, the price signal operates on consumers through the relative costs of goods. So yes, the overall increase in consumer prices is just under $10 per week. And yes, the average household assistance is over that. But that help is provided in cash, and it can be used to buy relatively lower carbon products, which means it can be used to buy products which cost relatively less. So yes, you may be no worse off if you stay with all your existing purchases, the basket of goods you buy every week, but you do have an incentive to save by switching to other products. And the bottom line is this. With the price signal in place, we will cut at least 160 million tonnes of carbon pollution out of our atmosphere in 2020, the equivalent of taking 45 million cars off the road. Or put another way, in just nine years' time, that is a cut in every Australian's carbon footprint of almost one quarter, compared to where we would be without a price on carbon. That's why we're doing it, to cut carbon pollution, to build the clean energy future we need. I've met some interesting people and I've heard some interesting things in the last few days. When you give Australians a chance, they give it to you pretty straight. I love that about our country. I enjoy the scepticism and I respect the scrutiny. And I also love that Australians in our suburbs and towns are taking on the serious task of judging what is the best approach for our country's future. And I saw some of that on display last night. Everyone involved in politics and in government can learn from that. And if we listen to Australians, we're going to learn a lot more in the coming months. We're going to learn a lot more than about pricing carbon. We're going to learn something about this country's capacity for reform. I don't agree with those who say this country isn't up to it. And I certainly don't agree with those who say we, are a we were a better country 30 years ago. No. I just believe this is what the reform road is, what reform is always like for Labor. Let's face it, if change was easy, a Conservative government would have done it by now. I've talked to you a lot about walking the reform road and the fact our country should be walking it together with government, working with business, workers and communities, all of us together alongside about the fact it's a long walk, not a short sprint, a road towards long-term goals for the good of our nation, where the measure is in years. But I still think that some of you picture the reform road as an easy way through a wide gate. It's anything but. The reform road has many obstacles, potholes to get around and hard hills to climb. The wind is not always at your back. But I've got my walking shoes on. Because as I think about Australia at the end of this year and be in the decade beyond, I don't only see a country which will be building a clean energy future, though I do certainly see that. I see a country which will have rebuilt its faith in its own capacity to reform. It will be a realistic faith which knows what the reform road is like. It will be a determined faith an optimistic and activist creed that drives us forward. And it will be a faith, a faith shared between a creative and confident people and a government ambitious for the future we share. I've been Prime Minister for a year now, and as well as governing and reforming, it's been a period of learning. I'm learning more about Australians, meeting people and getting to know them. It's really a great privilege. Australians do want to know more about me and how I lead this government and how I will do so in the coming years, especially when confronted with new challenges in the future. 
And that means they do want to know what kind of person I am. And look, I'm a decision maker by nature, and I've tended to let the decisions speak for themselves. It doesn't come easy to me to express the feelings I have as I make those decisions. I was the shy girl who studied, who worked hard, and it took time and it took effort, but I got all the way from Unley High to the law and as far as I am here today, standing where I am today. I've brought with this a sense of personal reserve to the most public of professions. And the rigours of politics have reinforced my innate style of holding a fair bit back, of hanging pretty tough. If that means people's image of me today is one of steely determination, I understand that and I understand why. But I don't forget where I came from, why I'm here or what I've learned along the way. I don't forget Unley High, where I saw the kids at the back of the room, the ones that they made the work for because they didn't think they could succeed. I don't forget how I felt at Slater and Gordon when I won my first case for a clothing out worker. I got her the pay she deserved and she said thanks. I don't forget September 2008 when the world stood on the brink of economic disaster and it took a Labor government, this Labor government, to take the urgent action necessary, the decisions that were right, to save Australian jobs. What I've learned and believed through all of that is it's one thing to hang tough and hold a bit of yourself back, but nothing ever gets easier by putting it off till later. And because of that, in the moment I truly believed I was going to be Prime Minister, I told myself, don't ever put a hard call off because it will only get harder every day. Be a Prime Minister, a leader who sees the future of our country, the future we can have, and be a Prime Minister who has the strength to put it in place, to get us there. That's the leader I'm determined to be for you. So I'm walking the reform road now, walking that road of reform because it's necessary for our country. We must look beyond the next opinion poll and the next election to the clean energy future of the next generation. It's time to get on with it. This has been an issue for Australia for a decade. There have been plenty of missteps and plenty of false starts. No leader, no government has been perfect, and I take my share of the responsibility for that. And as I said, uh, as what I said before the election, which has been the subject of so much commentary, understandably, what I said before the election, I can't unsay now. But when it became clear the only way to achieve action on climate change was to introduce a temporary carbon tax before moving to an emissions trading scheme. The choice was this and the choice was clear. I either stuck exactly to what I said before the election, got no action on climate change and did the wrong thing for our nation, or I found a way, a way to get climate change action, to do the right thing for our country and to deal with the consequences. And what I knew in my heart was this, nothing gets easier by putting it off. And if you don't do what's right for this nation, then you shouldn't be Prime Minister. So now it's time to get in and get this done. Time to deliver on climate change, time to deliver the action we need. Time to focus on the crucial debate now facing this country, because in reality, the choice I faced after the election is the same choice the nation faces. To do what is best for Australian families, what is best for future generations, what is best for this country. To act on climate change, to cut carbon pollution, to build a clean energy future. I can't and I won't just say no. That's why I'm putting a price on carbon. I know this is a big change for our country. I also know we have the courage to do it together. And as we do it together, I think we're going to prove to ourselves that the courage to reform isn't beyond us. 
and that there are more opportunities for us to seize together. I see a great clean energy future for our great country and a great reform agenda for the current government too. We'll continue delivering those reforms. I know we can get there. I know we can do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Time now for questions from our working media members. The Prime Minister has indicated she does want to take all of the questions on the list. I think we've got 12 or 13 questions, but I would still urge our members to restrict themselves to a single question when they do ask. Our first question today from the Australian Financial Review, Laura Tingle. Uh, Laura Tingle from the Financial Review, Prime Minister. Uh, the News Corporation Group are facing questions in Britain and the US about whether they are led by fit and proper persons to control such extensive media assets. Do our media ownership laws have sufficient fit and proper tests in them? And what will be the appropriate res response from the government if governments elsewhere in the world make adverse findings against news? Like uh, I think most Australians, I've been pretty shocked and disgusted to see the revelations that we've seen in the United Kingdom, uh, to see some of the things that have been done to intrude on people's privacy, uh, particularly in moments of uh, grief and stress in their family lives. I've truly been disgusted to see it. And I'm not surprised that that's uh, causing in our national conversation a uh, consideration about the role of the media uh, in our democracy and the media's role generally. So I'm also not surprised to see that uh, in Parliament or amongst parliamentarians a conversation is starting about the need for a review. And I will be happy to sit down with uh, parliamentarians and discuss uh, that uh, review that people are obviously contemplating. I would also point to the fact that there is in train already and has been for some time a convergence <coughs> review which is helping us look at a section of issues about the changing nature of media platforms in the electronic media. Uh, so that's already underway. Uh, but of course what we're seeing in the UK has principally been an issue about print media and print media is not covered by that convergence review. Uh, so I anticipate we'll have a discussion amongst parliamentarians about this, about the best uh, review and way of dealing with all of this. I'll be interested in people's ideas. And I think whatever uh, Parliament does or doesn't do, uh, there is going to be a national conversation uh, about the media's role and media ethics in the weeks and months ahead. Next question from the Herald Sun, Phil Hudson. Prime Minister, Philip Hudson from the Herald Sun. I think it can probably be observed that you've uh, moved forward, so to speak, from being a shy girl. Um, and today you've outlined very passionately uh, your case and your vision for why you're taking on this political fight. But does it disappoint you that some of the people you meet, and as you said today, give it to you pretty straight, have been saying some pretty nasty things about you and, and do question your honesty and your integrity and given that, what do you say to some of your own MPs who, it must be said, fear that it's too late to convince people? Do you think you can turn voters around on this by election day? Uh, for me, Phil, uh, I, I know that uh, your job and the job of many of the other uh, media representatives around the table is to uh, make the calls on politics and write the uh, opinion pieces and commentary from various contending perspectives about the politics of it. Uh, I'm not being governed by the politics of it. As I said to a community forum in Brisbane last night, it's pretty hard to explain, having made the judgment call to go ahead and put a price on on carbon if you were just going to be driven by the politics of it. Uh, so I know for others this is all through the prism of uh, opinion polls and the like. For me it's not. For me it's about doing the right thing for the nation's future. And I understand that uh, people, you know, Australians do give it to you pretty straight. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a great thing about our national characteristic. And I'm always very happy to engage in those conversations. And I think I hold my end up in those conversations. And I think people are open to being persuaded. I saw some evidence of that at the community forum in Brisbane last night too, when given the facts and an opportunity to ask their questions, people did change their minds. Uh, so I'll be working to continue 
continue to do that over the weeks and months ahead. Uh, and, you know, uh, Australians will make up their mind. They'll make up their mind in the 2013 election. Uh, but as a nation, we will have done the right thing by then and put a price on carbon. Paul Bongiorno. Uh, Paul Bongiorno, 10 News, Prime Minister. I've noticed over the years that uh, governments tend to claim mandates and oppositions deny them. Uh, in this, Paul, uh... you've lived too long. <laughs> <laughs> Not long enough. <laughs> Uh, in this very <laughs> In this no, I'm not saying I don't want you to keep living. I didn't. I don't. If there was an implication of that, I'm, I, it's not what I meant. I think that's what Phil Hudson just said to you. Thank you very much. The wisdom of years is about to dawn us. Um, Tony Abbott keeps saying that the next election will be a referendum on the carbon tax and he will rescind, rescind it. Uh, Bob Brown in this very room a couple of weeks ago virtually said over my dead body that the, um, <laughs> that the uh, Greens will stick by this reform. Tony Abbott uh, in uh, the last couple of weeks has come up with a, a pretty uh, whiz-bang piece of political analysis that some of us maybe regret we didn't do ourselves, that he said that just as the, la the 2007 election rejected work choices and the Liberals saw that was the reason for their rejection and dropped off it, uh, enabling your reforms to go through. He says that if he wins the next election, the referendum, the people will have spoken and Labor will uh, help him rescind the tax. Now, I know you don't like hypotheticals, but this is a test of the reading of, of the Labor Party's commitment to this reform. Can it survive an election? Well, Paul, I don't think anybody during these days can doubt my commitment or the Labor Party's commitment to this reform. And I am going to disappoint you, and you probably bring your long experience to judging prime ministerial answers on hypothetical questions. Uh, but I am going to disappoint you, and I'm not going to answer a hypothetical question for you. I'm not going to talk about the days beyond the next election. I'm going to talk about today and tomorrow and the days in between as we get move to the 1st of July next year and put a price on carbon. And then, of course, Australians will judge that in 2013. Uh, but I'm not bringing the same cynicism to this task that is driving Mr Abbott. For him, this is all about the opinion polls. Uh, he's defined his views about climate change entirely against the opinion polls. Uh, you can ask Malcolm Turnbull for a fuller analysis of that. Um, <laughs> For, for me, uh, that's not what we're doing and it's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we believe the science is real and our nation has to cut carbon pollution. We listen to the economists and respect their advice when they say the cheapest way to do it is to put a price on carbon and that's exactly what I'm determined to do and we will do from the 1st of July next year. Phil Curry. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Phil Curry from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, as a former only high student myself, yes. was, uh, yes. I, I, I often throw, throw one out of class rather than set up the back. There, but, was, there was no implication you were in the back of the no, class, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, very, very middling to average. But, um, could I ask you to expand on that, that, that towards the end of your speech when you spoke about your shyness? Are you telling us that you, that you feel you have a perception out there as being too robotic, um, emotionless? Is that, is, that, is that what you're trying to tell us and, and you're trying to appeal to the people more broadly that that's not the case? Good. Phil, I, uh, I, I am who I am and I guess I feel the need uh, as Prime Minister to show some more things about myself uh, and uh, I mean you're uh, a lot younger than me, it pains me to say it, so we weren't at Unley High School at the same time. Uh, had we been at Unley High School at the same time I think you would have seen someone who uh, wasn't known as an outgoing person. I am in a profession uh, which requires me to uh, be in the public gaze and to, uh, you know, be out there talking to people. I've always enjoyed um, chatting to people, but clearly the circumstances under which I do it now with TV cameras rolling and all of those sorts of things, they're not necessarily uh, natural to me. I didn't sort of come uh, to this task with a um, you know, predis predisposition to be in the public glare in quite that way. 
And uh, for me to show uh, every aspect of myself in that sort of odd environment that I live and work in uh, has been a challenge. And I think one of the things I've tended to do is uh, allow decisions to speak for themselves rather than trying to explain to people the motivations that drive me. And those motivations are very deeply held and very sincerely held. So one of the things that I think I've learned over the 12 months journey of being Prime Minister is it's better to explain to people what's driving you as you make the important changes for the country's future. And I'll be uh, seeking to do that, and I'm trying to do a bit of that today, uh, by explaining the things that form my views about education and opportunity, explaining the things that form some of my views about disadvantage and fairness at work, explain some of the things that form my views about respect and how we can work <coughs> together uh, those things are very important to me. They're deep within me, and I'm very, um, um, you know, pleased. I suppose uh, isn't maybe the right word. I'm uh, prepared to talk about them uh, to help explain to people some of the policy decisions I make, rather than assuming people will see the values behind the policy decisions. Next question from the West Australian. Prime Minister Shane Wright, The West Australian. Um, through the week that we've been talking carbon, overseas, Moody's has discussed it's going to downgrade American credit. Uh, Barack Obama today walked out on a meeting with Republicans about the debt ceiling. The eighth largest economy in the world, Italy, there's a huge doubt whether it can repay its debts. You've talked during your speech about the problems back in 2008. Are we sleepwalking back into a repeat? And has this government got the wherewithal to react to what may be occurring overseas? Well, we've shown that we've got the wherewithal to react to all circumstances, no matter how pressing, how urgent and how dire. We did that during the days of the global financial crisis. Uh, as for where we are in the economic cycle globally, uh, you're right, there are some troubling things, uh, some very troubling uh, material that comes out of Europe. We see that. We've seen it with Greece. Uh, you've just referred to Italy. Uh, and uh, we, of course, are seeing uh, a sluggish uh, American economy, uh, where whilst over time there have been some better signs in some of the indicators, there have also been some disturbing signs. For example, the most recent employment figures were a disturbing sign. So we live in a world which still has uh, cause for concern in the global economy. Uh, but we've taken all of that into account as we've worked out how our nation is positioned and what we can look forward to in our economic future. And I'm confident that the predictions that have been made for the Australian economy continue to hold true. Uh, the underlying fundamentals of our economy are very strong. Uh, we've had uh, natural disasters pushing us around and pushing around the economic figures. Uh, we, of course, have got the stresses and strains that come with an uh, economy where a high Australian dollar driven by resources is putting pressure on some other areas of the economy. But even with all of that, the uh, underlying strength of the economy is there and we will continue to see it manifest in things like uh, low unemployment numbers and our most recent unemployment number continue to have a four in front of it. Uh, so on pricing carbon and how it fits in, of course we've got to keep working to keep our economy strong. But given we know the fundamentals of our economy are strong, I would say to people, what better time to come to dealing with this challenge than now? We can cut carbon pollution. We can do that whilst our economy continues to grow strongly. We can do it as employment continues to grow strongly. And we can do it as we assist nine out of ten households. If you can achieve all of that, uh, my rhetorical question would be, why on earth wouldn't you do it? Mark Riley. Uh, Mark Riley from the Seven Network. Prime Minister, I'm always asking you about you, so I wanted to ask you about us. Um, uh, let's talk about you for a while, Yeah, let's Mark. talk about me. Um, me and my friends here. Um, I think uh, a few of us have been reflecting on this in the last few weeks and certainly in the last couple of days um, uh, very sharply on our responsibilities. Um, when we see a gentleman in Gladstone uh, trying to uh, uh, encourage people to take up arms against the government, um, a woman in Melbourne being shoved out of a public meeting and harassed down the street to tears. Uh, uh, you confronted in um, a shopping centre by people screaming and 
Liberal Party members calling you a liar and then a radio station coming here and broadcasting all day in the first uh, day back of Parliament to whip climate change uh, opposers into a frenzy. Um, how do you see our responsibility and, uh, and the way that we should be reporting this matter? Um. I think we will have a long debate about media ethics in this country, but uh, if I could put it as clearly as um, I can, I'd say to you, don't write crap. Um, can't, <laughs> can't be that hard. Um, and uh, when you have written complete crap, then I think you should, uh, I think you should correct it. Uh, so I'd like to see as many column inches confirming that there's no 6.5 cent a litre charge on petrol as I saw reporting Tony Abbott's claims that there would be. I'd like to see as many column inches and minutes on the TV news reporting that the future of the coal industry is bright and strong, as verified by a huge coal company like Peabody's, as I saw coverage of Tony Abbott standing in a Peabody's mine saying the coal industry was going to close down. I'd like to see as many minutes of coverage and column inches uh, on the steel industry and the work we've done with the steel industry so they are uh, satisfied with the arrangements that, that we've made about carbon pricing. I'm not saying they're not under pressure, they're under pressure because of the global economic winds we were just talking about, but they are satisfied about carbon pricing. I'd like to see as much time devoted to that as was devoted to Tony Abbott's claims when he stood next to steel workers that Wyala was going to be wiped off the map. And there's a new one today. Uh, we've had uh, Nystar. Uh, they're involved, of course, in making zinc. Uh, they've put out a statement that says the impact of this tax is not considered to be material to Nystar. This is a, against a Tony Abbott claim. If we have a carbon tax, that smelter closes down. Well, I think the Nystar accuracy needs to get as much exposure as the false claim did. And if we saw some of that, some accuracy and facts out there, I think what I had the opportunity to do at the community forum in, in Brisbane last night, uh, and I don't mind taking criticism on the chin, that's part of my job, uh, but when I was there talking to people about the facts and talking to people afterwards more casually, you could see once they got that information, the sense of reassurance it gave them. And it changed a lot of minds. Now, you would say it's not your job to change minds about a government policy, and that's true. But I think it is your job to get information to people that's accurate and rigorous. Uh, some of the crazier claims we've seen in this debate need to be put to one side and the accurate facts get out there. The Canberra Times, Ross Peake. Ross speak from the Canberra Times. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Uh, I don't think anyone who uh, heard your speech today would doubt the passion that you're putting into this drive. Now, look, I don't know if uh, Greg Combe heard your speech, but he said this morning you were doing brilliantly. So I wanted to know whether you agree with that assessment. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, uh, when are you planning to visit the Latrobe Valley? And if you do, will you be dropping in on the Hazelwood uh, power station? Thank you. Uh, well, I'll let Greg Combe's words speak for themselves. Um, on the Latrobe Valley, I understand that there's uh, anxiety there in the Latrobe Valley. Of course, there would be. I'm quite familiar with the Latrobe Valley. I mentioned in my speech about uh, working at Slater and Gordon, we had an office in the Latrobe Valley. We did a lot of uh, cases down there. I, I didn't do them personally, uh, but the cases down there were mainly workers' compensation cases. There were some asbestos cases and the like. So I've travelled to the valley on many many occasions, uh, and I'd be happy as Prime Minister to go there and talk to people about the future of the La Trobe Valley. Uh, it's a place that's undergoing a journey of change. It's already undergone a big journey from the days of state electricity uh, generation, then privatisation came. That made a big change to job numbers, to apprenticeships, to trainees. Uh, they've been through that journey of change, and I'll be happy to talk to them about what I believe can be a very strong future for the La Trobe Valley. Kieran Gilbert. Prime Minister Kieran Gilbert from Sky News. Following on from Mark, uh, Mark's question, you, you showed a bit of emotion in, in your speech today and, and there have been at times vitriolic attacks against you. Uh, you've been labelled a liar basically on a daily basis. A lot of aggro in this. Are, are you feeling it? 
Oh, I don't say I feel, uh, I feel a burden from that personally. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I feel a sense of determination about getting this done, and I always understand that the you know political contest is going to be uh, hot, and I've never shied away from a you know red hot go in a political contest. That's not in my nature either. So I'm not someone who uh, lies awake at night you know pondering uh, you know poor news coverage or the use of uh, harsh words. I don't worry about those kind of things. I do worry to the extent that it um, uh, may uh, make it more difficult for us to achieve what we need to get done. So my aim here is the clean energy future and getting us there. Uh, it's, you know, it's a hard thing to push for. It's been a very hard thing to push for in this country. We're not the only democracy to have struggled with this big challenge. Uh, President Obama's had his ups and downs too. Uh, but I'm absolutely determined to push and push through and get us there. Uh, so the sense that any of this may be making that task more difficult, I think about that. But it doesn't personally upset me or distress me. I am, um, you know, in essence, made of pretty tough stuff. Michelle Grattan. Michelle Grattan from The Age. Uh, Ms Gillard, the ALP primary vote is now down to 27 per cent in the two major polls. While it's clearly taken a knock in the carbon argument, Obviously, there have to be other factors at work. Could you outline for us what you think those are and what Labor can do about them? Uh, well, Michelle, that's a pretty uh, big question and may need to be the subject of another speech, another address. Uh, I believe that the uh, traditional concerns of the Labor Party, our traditional values, are well on display in this government and that people can see from the things that I push and the things that the party pushes for and we believe in a strong thread of continuity from Labor governments past. Uh, now, how our Labor values shape public policy, of course, changes. Uh, in the modern age, uh, we're about the distribution of opportunity. In ages earlier, we were about the distribution of income. We, of course, care still about the distribution of income, about decency at work, but the modern challenge is to distribute opportunity fairly so the kids don't stay in the back of that class. The kids that are there now get the same opportunity as other kids for a great education and a successful future to take just you know one one way in which opportunity can translate in our society but we live in an age where traditional uh, political party uh, uh, rusted on voters for traditional political parties are less than they used to be, uh, more is in contest than used to be, uh, and consequently we've always got to uh, renew and redo uh, how we pursue our values as those things change about our population. I'm an optimist. I believe so strongly in those values. I believe in their ability to win through. So even in an age of more challenges where less people automatically vote for a political party, where the way people get their information is different, I still believe those values can win through. So Michelle, I might be more optimistic in the analysis than you or others sitting around your table. Our next question from The Australian. Prime Minister Stephanie Balog from The Australian. Is it appropriate for ABC executives um, to make approaches to ministers when um, public tenders are being considered? And how many ministers have raised concerns with you about this? And what was the last bit? And sorry? how many ministers have raised concerns about this with you? Uh, well, it's not going to surprise you. Oh, you haven't lived as long as Paul Bongiorno, I can tell that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not going to surprise you that to the extent that uh, uh, there's been reporting today uh, and the reporting has suggested that it's about uh, cabinet proceedings that, like prime ministers across the ages, uh, I will say to you that government functions with cabinet as a confidential meeting place and we need to continue to do that, to do all of the economic work we do and national security work and I've got no intention uh, about talking about a cabinet, uh, any cabinet discussions of any nature. And because there's a tender process in train, I obviously have to be careful about what I say generally about the tender process. 
but it is public that additional criteria were recently added to that tender. We've also announced that the decision making, uh, that there would be a cabinet uh, discussion and that the decision maker would be Minister Conroy. Uh, I believed, and uh, obviously the government's believed, that's the appropriate process uh, given the importance of Australia's voice to the world. Uh, I certainly believe all ministers have conducted themselves absolutely appropriately at all times in relation to this issue and will get the tender uh, done in the time frames that we've announced. Lenore Taylor. Lenore Taylor from the Sydney Morning Herald, Prime Minister. In your speech you compared this reform with previous reforms that we've undertaken, but to take up your answer to Mark Riley's question, do you think there's more crap written and broadcast about this reform than previous reforms we've argued out as a nation? If so, why? What's different this time? And why do you think this debate stirs up such strong emotions? Uh, I think what's changed is the volume of crap. Um, so. Uh, I'm not suggesting that in the past, uh, you know, uh, everything that was written was wonderfully accurate and that we used to pick up our newspapers and have pages and pages of uh, public policy analysis. Uh, but I think with the new media environment where you are uh, both restless and relentless uh, in terms of content, uh, where with 24-7 uh, uh, media and the media cycle, with uh, the news channels that we have now, uh, people have to uh, keep getting new content into the debate. Uh, I think uh, the quality of the content uh, is possibly lower just because the volume has had to be higher. And I'm, I'm not putting that in a, a prejudicial sense. I mean, I'm uh, you know, full of uh, remarkable wonder about some of the things that Kieran and David and uh, Chris Yulman and others do. I just can't imagine people can just keep talking for that amount of time uh, about <laughs> Uh, some, sometimes very small pieces of content and there they are, <laughs> hour after hour, and I go and I go to a cabinet meeting and I come back and I put Sky on and go, he's still at it, how is this possible? Um, but uh, so, so it's, 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 a, it's a trade, it's a craft and you know it would do my head in so I've got no, uh, uh, I've got no sense that I'd like to swap positions uh, but uh, that does mean that volume wise uh, there's a lot going on and the accuracy of it isn't always as good as it should be. Uh, so I think we've probably all got to steady a bit and think what's really important in this debate and try and ensure that the facts get out there. Now, when you've got the facts, you're still going to have contending opinions. Uh, we can both absolutely accept what Nystar says about its zinc smelting and still have, you have a debate about carbon pricing, but we shouldn't get that central fact wrong. That's what I'm suggesting the challenge is for all of us. Two more questions, the first of them from Michael Keating. Michael Keating from Keating Media, Prime Minister. How will Australia's trade competitiveness be affected internationally by a carbon tax? specifically in regard to our major trading partners in emerging markets such as China, India and Japan? And will there be any loss of jobs and investment offshore to our trade competitors who do not have a carbon tax? Mm. You would see from the package I announced on Sunday that we've been very careful to work with uh, trade exposed industries that effectively take the world price and which are emissions intensive. Uh, so we've worked hard with them to get the package right. There's more than $9 billion in that. And then of course we've got the work with coal and the work with steel, the work with manufacturing, the work with food and foundries. Uh, so that there is still some price signal to them for change, uh, but so we are understanding the international conditions they trade in. Uh, in terms of the opportunities that that gives our great um, uh, trading companies, I actually think uh, we're working with them to protect Aussie jobs now and to protect competitiveness. Uh, but actually, uh, to use the language of economists, all the things we can do in the future are on the upside. Uh, this is going to be a change around the world that drives new industries. I've had people talk to me about you know, solar panels coming from China on ships, and I've said to them, well, just think about what you're telling me. Uh, China sees that there's a huge market in making solar panels. 
Why do you reckon they think that? Oh, because they think the world's going to a clean energy future. Uh, so we need to make sure we are seizing our fair share of these jobs in the clean energy future, and that's the economic opportunity that pricing carbon is going to drive, and I'm not prepared uh, to have us sit here and miss that economic opportunity. And our final question today from Mrs Schubert. Mr. Schubert from the Sunday Age. Prime Minister, you've taken us on a bit of a journey back in time today with re reflections on your time at Unley High and uh, as a Slater's lawyer. Can I ask you to strap on the goggles of hindsight one more time <laughs> and take us back to that moment when you made that pledge some days out from the election campaign that there would be no carbon tax under a government you lead. Can you tell us what was going through your mind at the time? Did you appreciate that Labor's model at the time did have a period with a fixed price in place, or did you just not conceive of that as being akin to a carbon tax? And do you regret having used words that closed off that option so tightly for you and that have been brought back to haunt you so much mm. in the interim period? Mm. Look, when I said those words, uh, we were obviously in the midst of an election campaign. We'd come to it after a very divisive debate on the carbon pollution reduction scheme, and that had, you know, uh, smashed itself to smithereens in the parliament and wasn't going to get through. Uh, and against that backdrop of a very divisive debate, uh, I think there was still a great deal of community confusion about what carbon pricing was and meant and the various forms of carbon pricing. Uh, so in my own mind, uh, I had a very clear view about an emissions trading scheme, putting a price on carbon, putting a cap on the amount of carbon pollution our economy could generate, having the market generate um, the price as we you know, sort of kept the carbon pollution capped as opposed to an ongoing structure of not moving to the cap and trade scheme, but endlessly having a carbon tax. So I had those two models in my mind. I did understand that the carbon pollution reduction scheme had a fixed price at the start. Uh, so I uh, said the words that have been so uh, well and continuously reported uh, and was uh, dealing with what I thought would be a scare campaign about an ongoing carbon tax, where that is not what I had in my mind as the future for our country. I had in my mind pricing carbon uh, and reaching an emissions trading scheme. Uh, now, when I said those words, I meant every one of them. And so, uh, you know, to go back in time, you say things you mean, and I meant what I said. Uh, then we had the election that was, the results that were, and I did face a choice in this parliament. And I could have said in this <coughs> parliament, um, I'll hold to those words, and the absolute logical consequence of me doing that would have been to say we'll put carbon pricing in the too hard basket, we'll put climate change in the too hard basket for another three years. Or I could say to myself, the most important thing here is to reach that clean energy future. If we get there via a three-year temporary tax and we get to that emissions trading scheme, that's going to give us the clean energy future. Uh, now, in judging those two and what was best for the nation, I decided seizing the clean energy future was what was best for the nation. Uh, now, the you know politics of it uh, have obviously been um, very, very difficult, and uh, you and others will reflect on that in your writings. And if I wanted to take the politically easy path, then it probably would have been politically easier to have shoved climate change in the too hard basket but it wouldn't have been the right thing for the country. So I'm determined to get this done, and we are getting it done. And can I just say on the, you know, use a bit of licence off your question, if I can just ask people to reflect on the journey here. Uh, I can't count the number of times I had a journalist say to me, you will not get this done. It is not possible in this parliament to strike an arrangement that will pass the parliament to, to price carbon. You cannot get this done. It will not happen. Well, we've got it done. It will happen. Uh, and I'd also say, standing here, uh, that uh, after what has been a long and difficult debate and a big scare campaign, I think the things in that scare campaign are crashing to the ground day after day. Uh, little bits of this scare campaign just come flying off it every day. Wrong about coal, wrong about petrol, wrong about steel, wrong about zinc and the list will go on. The scare campaign, I think, will continue to have bits fall off it because people get the facts and get the truth. 
We'll conclude on that note. Thank you, Prime Thank Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you very much for including uh, the Press Club on your schedule, uh, your very busy schedule, and what is obviously a, a very important and critical national debate. Um, it's Bastille Day. Um, you just remarked about pink for girls. Well, actually, it's uh, champagne, the correct sort of champagne, uh, on Bastille Day. I'm sure you don't need anything to sustain that silly determination, but you never know. This might help. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's a crumbling old barn.